Now, we've all heard that those who can't remember the past are doomed to repeat it. And history is full of great examples of financial bubbles. And while a select few do get mentioned often, a great many are simply forgot. I'm sure you've heard of the classics of the recent years, like the housing bubble that contributed to the GFC or the dot-com bubble, but it is less likely that you've heard of things like the tulip mania of the 16th century, the Mississippi bubble, or the crash of the South Sea Company. Painfully, they all share many similarities that are tied to our human condition, and they will continue to occur as long as we continue to be involved in financial markets. No, people are stupid. If you're someone who intends to participate in these financial markets, then understanding financial euphoria is going to make you both a better and more calm investor. If ever there was a simple explanation of the madness of crowds and subjective value theory losing all connection with reality, it was when we experienced the tulip mania of the 16th century. It is impossible not to see similarities between the madness that occurred during the Dutch golden age and the euphoria that we've seen recently regarding Bitcoin. And you can be as triggered as you want by that statement. You're actually only proving my point. The rise of the value of the tulip from 1634 to 1637 was wild. In particular, the bulbs of tulips affected by a virus which caused a unique coloring and aesthetic pattern became a luxury item. As the tulip grew in popularity, professional growers paid higher and higher prices for the bulbs that had this virus, and those prices rose steadily. This led to speculators seeing opportunity in this demand, and the speculation occurred here with forward contracts on these bulbs. If you think that over-the-counter financial products like Fords are a new thing, you are mistaken. The treatment of the tulip bulb during this period is a good example of the disconnect that can occur between asset prices and intrinsic value. And this isn't a unique feature of tulips or even of bubbles generally. You need to understand asset prices do not equal intrinsic value. You shouldn't expect it to. And actually, as a wise and calculated investor, you should relish in the fact that there is a disconnect between these two points. The successful identification of assets that are below intrinsic value is what you are looking for as a value investor. The circumstances where you actually get to make money. Oh, I, I like money. But we will get back to this later in the video. Yeah. I like money though. In February 1637, tulip bulb contract prices collapsed abruptly and the trade of tulips ground to a halt, and a number of tulip-based litigations were begun, with sellers seeking to enforce the future contracts on buyers who naturally did not want to complete these transactions. Why, for example, would you want to buy the tulip bulbs at inflated prices when the market has since crashed and you wouldn't be able to sell them? The history on this point is not as clear, but it seems that most of these contracts were simply never honoured, with the losses, albeit relatively minor in the perspective of the broader Dutch economy at the time, lying with the sellers stuck holding the devalued bulbs. One excellent example that too few people know of occurred in the US. Well, sort of. In 1717, the Mississippi Company was chartered in France and set out to colonise the lower Mississippi Valley in exploration for, among other things, gold. To raise funds for this, shares were sold in Paris on its stock exchange. Now, to be clear, Mississippi was not like many other European colonies in the New World at this time. It did not have the resources or wealth of other areas to be exploited by the colonists. But this did not stop the now infamous John Law from engaging in a wildly successful marketing campaign, spreading misinformation about Mississippi and the opportunities the colony was going to have. The campaign led to a wild speculation of the value of these shares, which sent them skyrocketing by a factor of 20 before the bubble collapsed and returned to the prices the shares were originally offered at years earlier. But now you've lost it all but $600. You got greedy, Martin. Following this collapse, Law was dismissed from his position and the shares in the company ultimately now rendered worthless led to a widespread financial stress. The enormous debt of the bank that was tied up with this all had to be taken over by the state. So ultimately the taxpayer foot the bill. And that sounds familiar, doesn't it? Way too familiar. On any given day that shares trade on exchange, there will be a number of prices that are achieved between sellers and buyers. These prices can at times be far too high, and at other times they can be, well, far below the actual worth of those shares. This is what Benjamin Graham is famously illustrating when he talks of Mr. Market, a hypothetical person who every day offers you a price to buy or sell a share at, and you simply need to accept it when and as you wish. Some days Mr. Market is exuberant, or others he might be despondent. His prices might in part be guided by genuine metrics like earnings, but it might also be guided by how he feels on any given day. A value investor understands that Mr. Market's offered prices 
is not meant to be an exact reflection of the value of the share. Sometimes he offers prices that represent a great discount on the actual value, and hence an opportunity for wealth creation. Other times, the price makes no sense and should not be engaged with. If the price continues to lose all connection with intrinsic value, well now you're looking at a bubble. Howard Marks, in a fantastic 2021 memo, Something of Value, offered the following essential underlying principles of value investing. First, you have to understand that securities are actually a stake in a business. Then, you have to focus on the true worth as opposed to the price. You have to use fundamentals to calculate the intrinsic value of that asset. You've got to recognize that an attractive investment comes when there is a wide divergence in the market between the price at which something is offered and the actual fundamental worth that you've separately determined. And you've got to have the emotional discipline to act when such an opportunity is presented and not otherwise. If you can get your head around this, you're really well placed to identify overvalued stocks and avoid being the victim of a direct bubble. And now, for what will undeniably be the most controversial part of this video. Everything we've discussed before is no longer current. The euphoria of those markets has passed and the bubble has popped. It is easy with hindsight to recognize that it was a bubble, but what is much more difficult is to face the financial euphoria and be a contrarian. Actually, no one can see a bubble. That's what makes it a bubble. That's dumb, Lawrence. People caught up in mania typically don't take to question it well. So is cryptocurrency an example of mania? Well, yes, I'm sorry. Given the lack of intrinsic value, it is pretty clear that there was an obvious speculation in years like 2020, which caused Bitcoin to more than triple within six months. This is obviously a form of mania. This does not mean that cryptocurrencies are useless or have no utility. It's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that as an example of financial euphoria, there is a reason why Warren Buffett is an outspoken critic against these. There is really no intrinsic value to a Bitcoin and its price is a clear the subject of human psychology and speculation. You should be wary. And look, if this section of the video annoyed you, that's totally fine. I don't care. You do you. I honestly have no issue with people buying it, but at least know what you're buying. There are obviously more bubbles and examples of financial euphoria distorting markets than we can ever talk about in a single YouTube video. We haven't discussed some of the old classics I mentioned like the South Sea Company bubble or modern disasters like the GSC but we don't really need to. If you haven't got your head around the idea of financial euphoria from this video, there are fantastic books written by people smarter than me, which you should go read. The example that led to this video is a fantastic book, which Howard Marks actually brought to my attention, called A Short History of Financial Euphoria by John Kenneth Galbraith. This book is a classic. It's short, it's sweet, and you should read it probably every year just to remind yourself of the madness of the crowds and how financial euphoria can completely distort markets and potentially cost you a lot of money. Thanks for watching guys. If you enjoyed this video, A, read the book, you'll love it, and B, let me know, comment, give me your thoughts, and if you're triggered by the Bitcoin stuff, let me know that too. Otherwise guys, thank you for watching.